Hello everybody. It's the warm, and I'm back for some more Raging Loop. We're going to be doing another extra story today. Hope you're all ready. Last time we got to see the after effects of the story upon two characters. The, the Doctor, Mr. Kiyonosuke Nasato, and of course our beloved demon queen, Rokako Uematsu. And really, the last story, that, that's pretty much... That, that's a lot of what I wanted out of an extra story. You know, I'm not sure exactly what my expectations were, but that was pretty good. We got to see how each of them were affected, and maybe a little hope for the future out of what had occurred. You know, it's, it's it wasn't just left... It wasn't just left alone and leaving me wondering, well, what? how in the world does she come back from what happened? You know, it, it actually answered that question, and yeah, there's uh, there's opportunity there, so congrats to them. Uh, hopefully it all works out. But now we're going to be moving on to Writer vs. Mystery Station. So if our first one was Illusion Comedy, next one was Comedy Horror, uh... There wasn't too much horror in that one, I don't think. But this one is being billed as strictly horror, so I hope you're all ready for that. Um, our intrinsic journalist eventually finds a mystery she didn't ask for. Can the wise boy save her from the heretical land illuminated by the light of madness? Now, that's a description. That's, that's quite something. So this is obviously referring to our Hisako Mamiya. And it looks like maybe she's decided to go go back into the to the mystery business as a journalist. We know that originally that's what she wanted to do, but then she switched to what was it, what was it food critique or, or food journalism. So maybe she's she's doing back to what she originally wanted to do. I don't know who this wise boy is. Would that be? It wouldn't be Mochi, would it? I don't know. Maybe this, maybe it's a new character. Let's uh, let's get started. Let's see how this goes. That's her uh, pen name, right? Mamiya desu. Oseha ni natte orimasu. Moshi ya nani ka arimashi ta ka? Iye, shinbun mite masu ga, soto kara wa chotto wakari zurai koto ga okite tara iya da na to. そうですか。それは何よりです。あ、まあよくあることですよ。なんとかストック使ったので原稿は落とさずに済みました。それでご用件は？え？うん。いえ、よく覚えておられましたね。私がそういうの昔書いてたって雑談。いえいえ、大
She normally worked behind a desk, so this day was special in that it was mostly field work. Asaka would have to worry about the content of the call later. <laughs> it was July. Tokyo heat was reminiscent of the tropics, and no one could blame her for cursing about it. A few hours later, she was near Shinjuku Station. Shinjuku. Hisako was slowly staggering inside. I beg your pardon. D is this suggesting she ran for hours? Couldn't take a taxi or... Or a bus or something? Huh, okay. The press conference was utter chaos. The company's PR were making excuses while newspaper reporters were barging them with questions. Barraging them with questions, rather. To Hisako, that wasn't a bad thing, since she could use the very situation for a humorous article. However, the other freelance journalists invited her to drink and dragged her around until it was late at night. Oh, maybe not. Maybe... Maybe this is afterward. Okay. I think I misunderstood. This is after the conference. It's hours later. Got it. All of them had grudges against newspaper and TV journalists, so they had a good time complaining about them. Isako, however, had been very uncomfortable throughout the whole thing. Isako was a journalist, but at the same time, she was an entertainment writer, and she was fully aware of that. She was the type to reveal new info just so the others could have fun. That got her some donations, so this was another part of her work to her. Her pride as a journalist didn't go beyond not writing lies and contacting the primary source herself. The other journalists seemed to be more about exposing the truth and defeating the media, and Hisako couldn't relate to that. Wasn't that just a facade? The desire to see things you shouldn't, the desire to laugh at others' misfortune, the desire to gain an advantage by knowing things no one else knew, the desire to take the moral high ground. Such desires were common to mankind, and wasn't journalism just a trade to present such products to the masses? They already violated laws and social norms to get new info. Didn't they have to put their lives on the line for their trade and work for their customers? If something wasn't going well, wasn't it just because they weren't doing their jobs right? Forcing a self-deprecating smile, she drank some of her shochi. So that's not what that is. She drank some of her shochu. And by the time it was time to leave, she'd emptied the whole bottle. While some of the others were, well, some of the others worrying, oh, with some of the others worrying about her, she parted ways with them. This wasn't enough for her to lose consciousness or concentration. The only problem was that she didn't get to enjoy the floaty, languid feeling alcohol gave. Hisako hadn't enjoyed a good night out drinking for a while. She was so busy, she had to refuse invites from her old friends, and often ended up having to go to gatherings she didn't enjoy. What kind of life was this? She chuckled to herself at that thought, but then pushed it aside. It was a dangerous thought to have while drunk. Shinjuku Station was like a maze. Making it to the last train would be a challenge. If she didn't make it in time, she'd have to stay in the station. Hisako had tough nerves, but even she was averse to the idea of sleeping drunk in the station. She remembered that there were lots of urban legends surrounding Shinjuku Station. There could be somewhat something inhuman among the passerby. There could be a cenotaph under the Chuo line. There could be routes that took you somewhere you didn't return from. Drunk as she was, she could maybe see one or two things she couldn't see normally. Just as long as it's not a vampire. However, she passed the ticket barrier, passed the platform, and got on the final train without encountering anything. 
With all the desk work she had to do, unless she was doing interviews, she could hardly go outside. And this time was taken up by the meeting with editors from a magazine com company. Participation in the press conference. Let me read that again. And this time was taken up by the meeting with editors from a magazine company, participation in the press conference, and the drinking party. Even between all of that, she'd taken out her mini laptop, made some drafts for the stricter deadlines, and made a few calls. It was a productive day, even by her standards, but she'd have to spend all of tomorrow locked up in her room again. No matter how much she worked, her life didn't become any easier. It was a common problem, but it was also true that many such people often wasted their money on momentary pleasures, such as alcohol or girls. She considered that maybe her payments would actually increase if she stopped considering her future and just lived as she wanted. Being on the verge of 30 made her somewhat uneasy. She casually opened her phone and found out she had over a dozen calls for each day. The job was so hard, yet the pay was so low. She understood that there had to be a my before that, but she still couldn't stop herself from complaining. If she couldn't gain money, she wanted to at least have an experience that you couldn't buy with money. In that sense, the incident in Fujiyoshi, where she was attacked by locals wearing wolf clothing, was quite special. However, it was dangerous, and she didn't earn any money for it, so it was lo a loss overall. Incidentally, that was the first time she'd encountered someone who claimed to be a fan of her work, Haruaki, Haruaki Fusaishi. Due to the danger he put her through, she wanted to know more about what happened there. They were still in touch via email, and she often tried to drag him in for an interview, but he always put it off, saying something about deadlines. He claimed to be a college or grad student. Was he studying a very difficult subject? It should have been summer break right now, so he should have had time, but it was now Hisako's turn to be busy. The circumstances weren't favorable. Though, she'd have some time after she'd crossed this mountain, so she had to plan her next job, whether or not it involved Haruaki. Hisako was always a curious person. She was born in Shikoku, and often interacted with the stories of the 88 temples, Gyobu, Tanuki, and any other mythical cultural aspects. She'd taken up folkloristics in a college near her home. It was very interesting, and she could study it with a passion. However, she'd never had the mythical encounter she'd always hoped for. She then went on to investigate urban legends and modern paranormal encounters. She'd even moved to Tokyo because she wanted to unravel the darkness of the city. She then got a job with a small magazine and was put in charge of the occult column, but uh, it didn't do well and went out of business in less than a year. Isako even felt that this sudden state of unemployment was the most paranormal moment in her life. She couldn't decide where to work next. Was writing articles as it were a part-time job and... She couldn't decide where to work next. Was writing articles as if it were a part-time job and eventually ended up freelancing. The, the the sentence confuses me. I think the middle part seems odd. She couldn't decide where to work next, and eventually ended up freelancing. That makes sense. The middle part confuses me. Okay. She was happy she, that she could feed herself, but she realized that this wouldn't keep going forever. Perhaps getting married would make her future more stable? But Hmm. The people in the publishing and magazine companies were either other women or had families, while her old friends from her homeland were already getting married. She wasn't really interested in the other journalists, especially after that drinking party. Yudai Hashimoto, the cameraman she briefly worked with, was someone she greatly respected. He was a man of character, skill, and always looked at things with the eyes of a professional. The little consolation after-party they had after the Fujiyoshi trip was actually the first time in a while she'd enjoyed drinking with someone. 
She was so drunk she even aired her complaints about the other journalists. He responded with a flat expression. それは、ヒューちゃんがI wonder what that really means. But I mean, it sounds... a bit... worrying. It's, it's worrying to read that. So ったヒトたちが社会を乱さずに暮らしていくために正義なんてものが必要なんだわかりやすいやつがね ジャーナリストも同じだよ。そういうのは必要だと僕は思う。Even if some ideals seemed empty, losing them could bring about an endless hell. Isako didn't know if that was Yudai's own take or if he was just playing along with her subculture-like idea. But she did feel that he was right. あの人くらい懐が広くて、見識があって、ダンディーなおじさまがどっかにいないかな。Though she'd have liked someone less horizontally challenged. She didn't mind fatter or slimmer people, but someone on Yudai's level was bound to cause a, a physical trouble in various situations. When she was little, Isako was a daddy's girl, and so far all the men she dated were older than her. She was entirely aware of her own Electra complex, and that it might have warped her eye for men. The inside of the train was almost completely silent. There were some other people in the car, but they were all sleeping on the seats. Many of them were as drunk as she was. She herself was half asleep, too. Whenever she closed her eyes, her thoughts became a mess, and she almost leaked saliva from her mouth. It was a strange sensation. She was certain that she wasn't having a dream, but was somewhere between waking and sleeping. Perhaps this feeling itself had been given by a dream? A drunk person's senses had no stability or certainty. She couldn't sense the passage of time. She couldn't hear anything. She couldn't feel the shaking of the train. Drowsy as she was, she did notice how the train stopped and a female passenger got off into the darkness outside. Hisako's house was in Kawagoe or Kawago. I'm going to say Kawagoe. It was a 50-minute train ride from Shinjuku, then 10 minutes on foot. She wouldn't know how to respond if someone asked whether it was a good spot. There were far more potato fields than residences there, so it was pretty dark out due to lack of street lights. The place Isako was renting was at the edge of such an area. The only reason she took it was the cheap rent and the fact that the area reminded her of her homeland. The dark night road was nearly empty. Of course, she'd never encountered anything paranormal on this path. The number of them had increased recently, and there were many signs warning about them. Apparently, they were the types who exposed themselves to women, but as long as they weren't violent, they weren't a problem for Hisako. That thought made her realize that she was aging, which only made her more depressed. The fact that the most unusual things she could encounter after moving to the city were just some perverts made her feel slightly strange. 
or excuse me, rather, really strange. Mm -hmm. She noticed someone walking in front of her. You could see lots of people walking out at night in the heart of the city, but that was pretty rare here. Rare enough for it to be unusual. Masaka. Pervert? She felt that she just imagined one into reality. No one else was here, and it looked like a man. It was easy to see him as suspicious. Normally, she'd have been more alert and have a, the good sense to switch to the other side of the road. However, she was more drunk than she'd realized. Uh-oh. Pervert's diet. Garlic's effectiveness in fending off perverts. Thinking of those and other more indecent headlines, she took out her notepad. She was actually planning to interview the pervert. Saka walked up. Saka walked up to and looked at him. He had luggage with him. Was he planning on pulling something out? He wasn't wearing a coat. The man was wearing a normal summertime clothing. And he was somewhat familiar. Oh my goodness. It's the boy. Are Masaka? That was her line. Check out the duds on this guy. Much more casual, huh? Look at that. That was her line, too. Hi. Man, I was thinking it was going to either be Mochi or an entirely new character. I, I did not call the Yasunaga Oribe appearance. Now wait, hold on a second. Wait just a second. I think there's been one or two times within the regular story where either Haruaki thought or someone else thought that Yasunaga and Mamiya might be a good match. And we just had Mamiya say she's usually into older guys. And we know Chiemi's taken. And we know Haru is taken. Hmm. Hmm, hmm, hmm. This might lead to something. She suddenly remembered the call. She'd been contacted by Kaori Oribe, the woman in charge of the dining hall in Yasumizu, and someone she'd wanted to interview on May. The lady called to ask for something. Her son had come to visit Tokyo, to visit colleges, but she neither... But neither she nor him knew any good destination, so she wondered if Hisako could help with that. When she was interviewing Kaori about Shishinare, Hisako had mentioned that she was studying folkloristics before. Apparently, her son had become interested in that recently. College students who knew what they wanted to learn even before they were enrolled were rare, so seminars were welcome passionate and skilled volunteers. This afternoon, they talked on the phone about it, agreeing on a new time. She was so busy, she'd missed most of the details, but Hisako was certain that she hadn't been told that the boy had ar already arrived in Tokyo. Her address wasn't on the business card she'd given them, and looking at his reaction, this meeting was surely just a coincidence. She could understand if it was closer to the metropolitan area. There were colleges there. Anyway, she didn't know of any local places where one could properly stay. Huh, how about that? That's one thing I had always wondered, where Takumi's family is. Hisako could understand that. The local prices were so low, and... There was a lot of industry and agriculture here. なるほどね。すっごい偶然。ね。夜のお散歩中ってわけ。いえ、そもそもたどり着けなくて。え?いくら住所を確認しても着かないから、もう諦めて適当にうろついていようと思って。はあ、presumably until you run into someone and ask for directions, right? Yeah, that seems a bit odd. Eh. Yo, 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 yo. What kind of thinking was that? He seemed like an intelligent sort back in Yasumizu. Was that a misunderstanding? Hero -hero 
行きのバスで眠れたので大丈夫ですそれに徹夜は結構得意なんで余震場そうでもどこか腰を落ち着ける場所は必要でしょ理想としてはええ電車はもうないかタクシーは走ってないけどもなんかこうさそうもっと早い段階で手を打つとかできたでしょう市外なら素泊まりでもいくつでも宿があったでしょうにいえそもそもお金がないんですそれなら深夜カラオケとかビデオ屋とかいや高校生は使えないかじゃあファミレスで粘るとかいや、yeah, I do wonder exactly how old he is I can't remember is he Obviously, he'd be more, he's much closer to Haru and Mochi in terms of age, but is he at the same age as them? Or, I mean, I would imagine he could be a year or two older than Haru or something, but obviously still young. I'm going to go to the next one. 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 I'm going to go to 500円あります。What? I'm not Japanese, but even I know that's not a lot. Was this a field trip to him? 基本的には食事も全部タクミニーの実家を頼るつもりだったんで。まあでも、パンとかなら100円で買えますし、なんとか。なってない第一今日徹夜しても明日は無理でしょそんな予算じゃ宿も取れないし。そうですね。自由時間を使って寝られそうな場所を探すしかないかも。公園とか、橋の下とか。This feels very. This feels this like this was not planned very well, Yasunaga, I gotta admit. He was severely lacking in street smarts. あのね、いくら予定の決まった大学訪問だって言っても、ちょっと計画がタイトすぎるわよ。特に社会では何をするにもお金がかかるんだから予算にはもっと余裕を持っていやうちって本当に貧乏で I mean fair enough but then you plan around that <laughs> Isako didn't know what to say she could tell that the settlement was special in that regard Even bringing one person to Tokyo was a great expense on their part. えっと、ちなみに私が紹介する大学っていついくつもりだったのえ紹介あら話伝わってないあなたのお母さんから今日の昼に電話があったわよ私の通ってた民族学の研究室を紹介できないかって要件で多分できるけどちょっと確認時間
えまさかそんな待ちなめちゃダメよしょうがないな打ち来なさいえ汚いけどその辺で寝るよりはマシだからほらこっちいやその悪いですよこのままふらつかれる方が悪いいいから来なさいま間宮さん酔ってます酔ってない酔ってますって She was But even if she wasn't she would have done the same thing surely She was optimistic and proactive She would act before she had the chance to be embarrassed about it and worry about it later That was what the freelance writer Kyuko Hose was like at the core まあ、考えてみれば運が良かったわここで巡り合えて会えなかったらねあなたも困ったでしょうし今まさに困ってます何が困ってるのかな僕トイレかどこかに入ってますねそれダメマジダメざっと掃除するからそのためにはまずこのタイトなおはずさんちょっと。This is going in a certain direction. Let's see if it continues there. Ah! Isako could remember fooling around like that, but then it all went blank. She woke up with sunlight in her eyes. Her head felt heavy. It wasn't bad enough to be a it wasn't bad enough to be a hangover, but it wasn't pleasant. She was wearing her indoor clothes, and there were other clothes and Other things littered all about, but she didn't mind. Where was he? She looked around her twelve to Tommy sized room and found a note on a small table next to the wall. It was a message written in steady handwriting. It's time, so I'm leaving now. Thank you for the phone. I'll figure out how to use it and contact you when I have free time. Thank you so much for looking after me, too. Also, I didn't see anything yesterday, honest. Yasunaga Oribe. She remembered that she'd lended him one of her personal phones. She had several, some for work, some for herself. He'd probably never used one before, but he, she was sure he would get by. It wasn't hard to begin with, and it had numbers for her other phones, so there would be no problems as long as he figured them out. Though he was the type to spend the night outside if he couldn't find a place, so he could easily make some strange misunderstandings. What if he tried to put money in it or forgot to charge it? Isako figured that it would all work out. She fired herself up and stood up. She had even more work than before, after all. They'd agreed that he'd come back once he was done for the day. No matter what he did here, he couldn't get far without money. She would clean up the place before he returned. In the end, Isako couldn't clean up the bathroom or bath last night, and she could only hope that he didn't see them. Also, when looking at it realistically, she didn't find a reason to give him money to stay and eat at a hotel or something. She had no obligation to do that, and if she gave him too much money, he'd probably be so humbled that it would be painful to her. She already had him stay over once, another day wouldn't hurt. He was a man, sure, but he was like a dozen years younger than her. If he was the sort of make some sort of mistake, he would have surely made it last night. Was it a good idea to call his mother as proof that there was nothing special happening here? She figured she would do it when he was around. If he would stay over again, she figured she had to prepare food for him. What though? Curry? Steak? Fried food? 17 year old had to be gluttonous, so the food had to be something substantial. Aha, 17. <laughs> Or maybe something weird yet extremely delicious. It was time for her to show off her knowledge as a critic of strange foods. Isako would leave the boy awestruck with her excessive knowledge of ingredients and cooking methods. That meant that this was basically part of her job. Nothing personal. It would surely take more time and effort just than just ordering something, but this was a matter of initiative. Well, hey, if she doesn't want to be a journalist anymore, maybe she could open up a restaurant. She's got tons of ideas and techniques now, right? Maybe something like that. With that decided, she had to open up her afternoon for shopping, washing, and utensil preparation. Of course, obviously, you know, it's not like she could just 
instantly do it. She would need tons of preparation and investment, but, you know, just a, just a thought. Izako had three articles to write today. It was nine right now. She'd overslept. Three articles in three hours. Was that a joke? However, instead of giving up then and there, she removed that makeup that had been on her since yesterday and faced her desk without even changing into something. She felt like she could do it. <laughs> After breaking her speed record writing up the three articles, she faxed and mailed them to the clients. One was signed off on instantly, while two needed some minor changes, which she'd done in no time. She wrote these out extremely fast, but that didn't really damage the quality. In fact, one company even praised her. The text has more oomph to it. Did something good happen? Good. Misako herself was aware that she was having fun right now. She'd shown her skill at the drinking parties she'd had with the girls in her college years, and she treated her previous partners to handmade food. But once she became employed, she no longer had time for any of that. She might have been more desperate for human contact than she realized. Did that mean that all her problems would be solved if she got married and made food for her hubby every day? That realization made her jump to her feet, then sigh. She had no good person for that role after all. With that, she now had half a day off. So she began cleaning and thinking of the menu. Come two o'clock, she put her makeup on and left. Oopsie daisy. If you heard a uh, noise just then, a Windows noise, that was that was my machine, not yours. As she locked the door, the key shone under the sun within this clear sky. The weather was nice. Yasunaga you know, so hadn't contacted her yet. It could have been simply that he was busy, or because he didn't actually know how to use the phone. Even so, he should have been able to come back without a problem. The mountain child's sense of direction had to be good, surely. Thinking that, Hisako went to the station. She passed the small station that echoed the announcements, and entered an old-looking car of a dull silver color. It was in the morning or evening rush hour, so there were few people both in the train and on the platform. She casually sat down and rested. Since she needed both rare ingredients and kitchen utensils, she decided to go to the supermarket in the inner city. Isako even made a note of what to get. If she'd finished within an hour, she was bound to return before the rush. She'd spend the next 40 minutes doing nothing. She would have loved to live her life, spending half of her days working and half doing household activities. She enjoyed them. And she would have loved to have a gentle, reliable older man at her side to spend such days with. She remembered the faces of her previous partners. One was a senpai in her college club. One was a young employee in a gastropub where she'd been a part-timer. And one was a senpai in her study department. The reason for breaking up was always the same. The man became bored of her. She could understand why. She wasn't the type of person a man would look for in a younger woman. She wasn't cute, was crude, had stern eyes, and was subculture-focused. Dating her for a while was enjoyable, but a lifetime of her was too much. It was like her current job trying out delicacies. She knew that she'd messed up when picking up her prefer her, when picking her preferred kind of man. She would have probably fared better with someone the same age or younger. But wasn't it too late to struggle on that front? <laughs> Isako decided to sleep for a bit. She'd been so energetic this morning that it was coming back to bite her. It could have been the alcohol, too, She, so she figured she had to rest a bit. And if she slept, she wouldn't have to think about the ghosts of the past. So far, she hadn't seen a single one of her ex-boyfriends in her dreams. And she wondered what that said about her. 
thinking such familiar things, she closed her eyes. Surrounded by other visitors, Yasunaga was standing in the campus of one of the colleges he was visiting. He went through two colleges and properly participated in a total of four relevant events, such as an open campus and simulated enrollment. It was rare for Yasunaga's own plans to fail. In that sense, this was, uh, this was particularly troublesome. The fact that he couldn't get to Takumi Muro's family's home was one such failure. He couldn't find the residence he was told about no matter how hard he looked. One moment he thought he was walking around only to come out on a completely unfamiliar path. He asked the locals for directions, but no matter how well he followed them, he'd just gotten more and more lost. He'd failed to find any public phones, so he couldn't even call to ask for someone's help. When it became dark, he'd given up on trying to get there and arrived at the road he'd been walked. He'd walked by in the morning. He couldn't understand what was up. Was it because the town was unfamiliar to him? Was that really it? It wasn't a coincidence. There, there was intent behind this. That time was the strange incident in which God appeared in Yasumizu. Even now he couldn't help but believe that it was done by human hands. After all, there was no god in this world who would send the poor residents of Yasumizu on a trip to Atami. <laughs> there were many mysteries, such as the wolf guy's suicide or the collapse of the head families, but it was clear that there was some sort of conspiracy, and going on the trip had protected them from its effects. They'd been saved by the clearly human, yet godlike person. When they'd come back, everyone in Kamafujiyoshi was shocked. There'd been a mist, yet everyone was okay. Not only that, but they came back on a limousine bus. Whatever had happened there, life in Fujiyoshi had become easier since then. He could barely, or he could vaguely fear that they, feel that their encounter with God was related to the fall of the village heads, and was a turning point for everyone else there. The difference in school life was the most striking. The students related to the village heads somehow vanished, and some had become friendlier with them. He always fell silent when asked, while Chikamochi joked around and Haru calmly dismissed everyone. But it wasn't just the people that had changed. He could feel something else. The thing that had been oppressing them had vanished, and there was now someone else who watched over them instead. He could feel it even now, when he was far away from Fujiyoshi. It wasn't unpleasant. He felt like he could... He felt like he could keep calm and live in it with confidence. Was the mountain god telling him to give up on exams and return? Haru had sent him off with a smile, so he didn't really think that was the case. She'd even sewn him a charm to keep him safe along the way and help him succeed in his studies. It was still in his bag, and he felt like it would bring him luck. It was a fact that he couldn't have bumped into her if he hadn't been wandering outside that late. Hisako Mamiya-san. She was an outsider to the isolated settlement of Yasumizu, and the first impression she gave off was that of a refined city lady. It was hard to become like her just by reading textbooks. Shemi Serizawa had gone to college in the city and also returned so refined that he could hardly recognize her. Really? That's your impression, huh? As one who had feelings for her, he found it both charming and unfortunate. After all, he'd fallen for the animalistic Shemi he'd known since childhood. Even, that was even if that was still there, the people, especially the men she'd met outside, had slowly changed her. By the way, when they'd returned from the Atami trip, she'd returned to college. She'd laughed and said that she would go meet God. She probably knew that God, and that smile could only mean that she... <laughs> Chemi had left Yasumizu and become free. Even if she was far away from him and it made him feel lonely, it was something to be glad about. He had to follow in her footsteps and become free himself. Switching gears, Yasunaga took out the phone again and called the addresses. The addresses, me, deadlines, me, connections. It just continued to ring and no one picked up. 
Was she asleep? It was already afternoon. The evening wasn't too far off. The rush in the morning had been awful. He could get out somehow, but the whole place would be packed again when it was time to return. He knew where he had to get off, but he wanted to avoid missing his stop and being unable to pay tr for travel again. He had to prioritize contacting Isako. Upon deciding that, Yastraga began killing time. After walking it around for about 20 minutes, Yasunaga entered a college library. The old wooden interior was lined with countless bookshelves, and besides the sound of the visitors turning pages, the place was completely quiet. According to the documents, this was the largest assortment of books in the area. Apparently only school employees and students could borrow books, but everyone could hang around and read, so it was a perfect place to kill time. You could also use one of the dozens of computers to search for the right book, or just find out more. Yasunaga knew TVs, but he'd never touched a computer. He figured he would need it in the future, though, so he certainly wanted to touch them. Also, the book from the hands-on learning exper experience left him intrigued, so he wanted to know more. It was a textbook about ruin excavation. Before, he'd wanted to become a lawyer to earn lots of money for his mother, but he'd been changing recently. His mother, Kaori Oribe, and Takumi Muro had begun to seriously consider getting married. She'd probably start to enjoy living in Yasumizu a lot more than before. Thus, she insisted that Yasunaka and his brother do whatever they wanted. About a month ago, Kinosuke Nasato, who'd left Fujiyoshi, had sent Yasunaga a sealed envelope. Inside, there was a letter and a photo of a god's mask. He wrote that he had the thing with him, but if Yasunigu, y Yasunigu, that is not that word, but if Yasumizu wanted to prepare a proper place for it, he would return it to them. The Nasato documents said that a certain someone had dug it up from Yasumizu. Kinosuke had no affinity for this kind of thing himself, but if Yasunaga was interested, he could contact his family and have them help him. Yasunaga had been captivated by the possibilities the letter provided, as well as the shape of the mysterious mask displayed in the photo. He knew that studies were about looking for reasons and results. If there was a reason, there was a result. So by knowing the reason, you could know the result, and by analyzing the result, you could arrive at the reason. As results and reasons switched places, things that had and didn't have a shape would switch places and create an unexpected value. Yasunaga found this extremely interesting. That was why he enjoyed learning and why results followed him. Through mock exams, he'd found out that he could easily be top of his class in college. The path of a lawyer was open to him. However, he was enchanted by the wolf mask. He wanted to know who made it and why, and the reasons why it had so many similarities to the mountain festival wolf costumes and face cloths. What methods would be involved in finding that out? Such que questions made him extremely excited. This reminded him that Hisako had said she would recommend him to a folkloristic seminar. If he chose to go there, Hisako would become his senpai. He had a few more questions about it, so he would stay at her place again. He wasn't sure if she'd allow that, but he wanted to talk. Last night she fell asleep in an indecent position, and he couldn't even ask her anything. He remembered how she turned around and said, Dame <laughs> He shook the memory off. It was best to act like he hadn't seen anything. Yasunaga was quite perplexed by the difference between her usual self and when she was drunk. She did seem older than him, but still far from old. As though... As he thought such things, he realized something. He might have a thing for unprincipled older ladies. Yameo. He failed to get Chiemi, so he would go for Hisako? That would be too simple, straightforward, and hasty. Instead, he focused on the library. He tried calling her on the phone again, but the result was the same. Yasunaga sighed, put the phone away, and entered the library. She regained consciousness, but couldn't properly process reality yet. And on the surface, it looked like everything was normal. She couldn't realize that there was no conformity in her awareness and that something was really off. 
It was night. Outside the train car was pure darkness, and the light outside only seemed to emphasize it. Mizako Mamiya instantly assumed that she was riding on the late night train, returning from work that tired her so much she'd fallen asleep on the train. She clung to that story for a few seconds, but as her thoughts became more clear, she became more pale. Had she slept too long? Had she been sleeping here for a whole few hours? What happened to Yasunaga Oribe? She abandoned the boy who needed her help. What a horrible thing to do. Sako quickly dug through into her bag. The two phones she bo had both said it was... F the, both phone the two phones she had both said it was four minutes past midnight and that there were no missed calls or texts. Not only really that, but both of them had said that they were out of service range. Out of range? On a train line? She then realized another thing. This wasn't a loop line. If she'd overslept, she would have awakened, been awakened and kicked out. Even if that didn't happen, she would have been caught up in the rush. No way she would have kept sleeping then. In that case, what was happening here? She naturally assumed the reverse, i.e. that her meeting with Yasunaga was just a dream. She'd gotten really drunk, got on the last train, and that was when reality ended. She began having a dream where she met Yasunaga Oribe and let him stay over. That wouldn't explain everything. She didn't have her personal phone with her. Unless she dropped it somewhere, she'd lended it to Yasunaga. Then there was the shopping list she'd made. It was hard to argue that she'd made it while sleeping. She definitely got onto a daytime train and somehow arrived here. A train with no one else but her. Something wasn't right. Hisako finally realized that she was in an unnatural situation. Basically, something paranormal. Unlike a certain swindling author, when faced with the paranormal, normal people felt only fear. <laughs> she licked her lips. Hisako had been dreaming of seeing something paranormal her whole life. Even though she knew by now there, that there were always just people behind the curtain, she still chased the darkness. And this time, she'd finally gotten what she wanted. She'd been waiting for this for a long waiting for this for a long time, and she was ready. She prepared and put up a front. It was time for her to show off her skills as an ex-occult writer. She stood up. Her car was the fourth, the same as she'd gotten on. It looked like a normal train if you ignored there were no other passengers. Isako moved through the car and opened a door. There was a soft curtain wriggling at the connection, and it seemed to visualize the loud but organized sounds and vibrations. The train was still running. To the third car. All the same. To the second car. All the same. All the same. The train was still running. To the first car. All the same. All the same. All was the same. The train was still running. All was the same. All was the same. All was the same. The first car was the front. Isako covered her mouth. Even though she hadn't eaten much this morning, she was hungry. In fact, she felt an intense urge to vomit. As she went onwards, she became aware that there was some sort of an anomaly that affected the nervous system. Her thoughts became dull, and her paralyzed sense of danger made her unable to realize it. Her physical condition was just getting worse and worse. Urge to vomit, headache. She finally realized that something was even more wrong than she thought. Lack of oxygen? Odorless gas. The journalist who looked into cases of carbon-based suicide had told her that carbon monoxide poisoning made people fall asleep and just die. <laughs> there had to be someone at the front. The train wouldn't be moving otherwise. Hoping for help, Hisako staggered over a head. She felt like she could fall at the slightest curve. How long would this train keep going forward? Upon arriving at the front, she looked through the window into the conductor's seat. There was no one there. Or rather, she couldn't perceive it. The part of the scenery through the window where the driver should be seemed to be cut out. 
She couldn't see it, as if she was actually blind to just that part. Though it didn't look like there was something there, it was probably worse. That place itself just didn't exist. Basically, it was a space that rejected the laws of the physical world, something fatal for human perception. She quickly looked away, her vision returned, but the car wasn't the same as before. It looked like it had been left underwater for half a century. There was rust, tears, and rot everywhere. Or tears, rather. The doors were dirty, the seats were torn, the walls were eroded, and the windows were covered in dirt. However, none of that could compare to the advertisements hanging here and there. After all, they weren't in Japanese. It wasn't the alphabet or Hangul, either. Nor was it Hebrew or Arabic, either. The text seemed like warped, heretical, evil hieroglyphs that couldn't have been created by a human hand. It made her realize that she'd been seeing them for a while, but only found them suspicious now. Yeah. Hisako's courage was quickly overwhelmed by fear and panic. Those who only knew wild beasts from zoos didn't know the fear of being inside those cages. The fear of filling her throat and crawling up her skin was just too great to resist. However, she could overcome it just enough to create a goal for herself. Escape. She had to get out. With only that thought in mind, she closed in on the nearby door. Above her, there was a rusty metallic cover hiding an emergency lever. The instruction on it was written in the same cryptic hieroglyphs, so she looked away. For a moment, she almost felt like they extended like tentacles and wrapped around her fingers. She forcefully opened the cover, moaning because of the tearing pain in her hand, and pulled at the rusty lever. There was an alarm. She knew it. She knew it was because of what she did, but she felt like it was a scream of the train-shaped yokai. With a high-pitched, wet, annoying, lowly, belittling, insulting sound, the train had begun to slow get down. A train broadcast. It was a male voice. It sounded somewhat monotone and sleepy, just like the train. She couldn't understand a word of what it said. Unable to bear it, she finally vomited, but even then she didn't let go of the emergency lever. Her fist turned pale from how hard she held it. Hurry. Hurry up and stop. Hoping for just that, she directed her cloudy eyes into the darkness outside, where she saw a white, square, luminous object. It was a station name. A station name in the Japanese language. It was there for just a moment, but she read it. The next moment, the train shook. Hisako almost fell, and the train stopped. The door opened up. Upon realizing that, she noticed that the other train cars were as clean as she remembered. But she couldn't trust her senses anymore. Breathing raggedly, she made her way outside. The voice from before followed her. That was close. She couldn't see the outside well but she realized that only a small part of the first car was next to the platform. If she'd walked out from any other car, she would have fallen on the tracks. Feeling hard concrete on her knees, she tried to stabilize her breathing, which was when her surroundings became dark. <laughs> the bright lights from the train had vanished. She turned around and saw the train, lying there like a corpse of a large beast with its jaws hanging open. It still made some mechanical sounds, but she felt like it would fall completely silent soon, like a cadaver. She didn't know why the train had to shut down right after an emergency stop. She didn't even know if there was a reason. Once her breathing stabilized, she stood up. There was... There were no light sources anywhere. She concluded that this was a platform because of the sign she'd seen from the inside. Ignoring that, this was just a concrete ramp. Even empty stations had night lights. What was this place? She already had info, however. 
The station's name was Kisaragi, and it was in hiragana. It fit the Japanese announcement she'd heard. Kisaragi wasn't a station she knew. It still didn't look like a proper train platform, but if that wasn't what it was, then what? But she quickly remembered that there was no guarantee that this was supernatural. Looking back at all the phenomena so far, it was likely that this was just an illusion. This was some station late at night, and she was just incapable of acknowledging anyone else here. However, she had to act based on what her eyes told her. All the horror characters who thought they were not insane were fated to die. She needed light, so she took out her phone. When she did so, something made her eyes widen. The battery was almost empty. How? It could last two days without charging, and it was relatively new. She concluded upon looking at the other phone. It ran out of battery faster, but it somehow had more than the other. And both of them were out of service range. She'd thought she'd escaped trouble when she left the train, but that idea was shallow. Maybe it would have been better to just stay in the fourth car. It was best to believe that something was wrong, but it was best to avoid extreme assumptions. She figured she had to look around a bit more. She took her the phone with more battery left and lifted it up. The weak light illuminated the platform and a rusty fence. There was nothing but a dense hedge beyond it, and there was no way to tell what was further. She directed the light up. There was a roof, a really small one, like ones used in bus stops, but it was also aged, but not as much as the train. There had been a schedule on the support here, but it was torn off, apparently. She looked at the text and numbers that were still there. It was no doubt Japanese. Was this actually an abandoned station? She lit up the rails. It was a one-sided platform, and beyond the rails there was nothing but a grassy cliff. Further in, there was a ticket booth and a small station-like building. She thought she saw a dim light beyond it. As her eyes got used to the dark, she could finally differentiate between the dimly lit cloudy sky and the lights in her hands, and the lights inside. There was something there. A station sign, perhaps? Hisaka walked by the ticket gate and directed her light to the other side. Darkness. Or rather, the outside was so vast that the backlight couldn't reach it. That meant she could leave. There were no workers at the ticket booth. It'd be too scary if there were. She shook her head, went forward, and looked inside the station building through the broken window. There was no one inside. There was a mess, but it didn't look like there was anything significant there. It looked like it had been abandoned after a thorough move. Nothing more, nothing less. All that was left now was finding out what the light was. She'd expected to just find a station sign, but what she actually found beyond the building surprised her. It was a vending machine. Coffee, fruit juice, sports drink, green tea. For some reason, most were warm, and there were even brands she knew well. Sako sighed in relief. Finally, she came across a piece of civilization she knew. At the same time, she became hungry and thirsty, and the puking had given her a sore throat and stomach. Additionally, it was also summer. The air around her was warm, and the tension made her sweat a lot. She wanted to drink some water. She, she took out a hundred yen from the wallet in her bag and put it in the machine. She pressed on the button for mineral rot water, and it fell to the tray. Hisako stuck her hand in and felt the cold of the bottle. It was standard European hard water. She opened it and brought it to her mouth. At that moment... She wondered what had happened to her caution from before. She didn't know what this place was. It could have been exactly like the train. There was no better time to question her senses than now. So, why did she choose to drink something from here? She knew better than the usual person that eating the food from a different world was an expression of willingness to become a bride of that world and reject the old one. Before her throat could enjoy the water, she threw away the bottle and vomited again. 
With that, she was assaulted by a powerful dizziness and headache. She spat and spat and tried to keep herself together. Then she looked at the vending machine. It was no longer just that. It was a gathering of creepy vines on a stone wall. The leaves were all bigger than her arm. And she could see it clearly now, for it shone. It was a white closer to blue. It was a beautiful blue-hot flame casting a light you'd only see in places like nuclear reactors. It brought about destructive energy that didn't allow life. It propagated and diffused and spread maliciously. The plant bore fruit. Hisako unhesitantly looked at the gel-like fruit, colored a malicious blue and filthy red. One of them rose right next to her feet, and its fruit juice was spread out like a granite, like on the granite floor she was standing on. She just ingested the juice of a fruit from a plant that was not of her world. She spit it out, though. Or did she? The surroundings no longer tried to hide their evil nature. The building was exactly the same as before. However, the base material had become granite. It was covered in the same cryptic hieroglyphs she'd seen on the train, and it made her scream a little. The train was now all rusty and rotten, just like the interior of the first car was. It was like a metal ship that had washed ashore. It seemed to symbolize the defeat of the human mind, or the victory of the evil living here. Struggling to keep her footing, she looked for proof that she wasn't going insane. However, that hope was shattered when she saw her phone screen. It showed only static, a field of unintelligible black and white. Everything besides her was going insane. No, even her own things were like this. How could she make sense of this? She couldn't even look at a mirror now. Though panicking again, she couldn't throw away her phones. They were her only weapon, after all. She worked the phone as best as she could. She even tried to do something on the other almost dead phone. She wanted it to connect to somebody. Anybody. Contact button up. Contact button. Up and down buttons. Call button. No luck. She couldn't connect no matter how hard she tried, but that didn't stop her. The small bit of rationality she had left told her it was pointless, but she repeated it regardless, for she had nothing else. He was calling Hisako every 20 minutes or so, but he had no luck with either of her phones. It was close to evening now, so it was best for him to return by himself. Certain she wouldn't answer, he called the Me Deadlines phone. Having no luck there, he then tried the Me Connections, knowing it was pointless. Normally there was a ringtone, followed by an announcement that the target phone wasn't in service range, but there was nothing. No cow call sound, no voice, nothing. Curious. Yasunaga Moshi Moshi. said that. There was no response. Mamiya-san desu ka? Boku desu. Oribe Yasunaga nan desu ga. Owatta no de ima kara kaette mo ii deshou ka? He said what he wanted. Suddenly. Oya, oya. Oya, oya, oya. Omamori wo watashite. Seikai deshita no. It was a voice he shouldn't have heard there. Haru-chan? Eh? Ware ga oru toki ni sono yobina wa tsumaran no. Mii-chan. Ah, gomen. Okami-sama. Janakute. Kami-sama. Eh, dou shite anata ni tsunagatta n desu? With a wolf-killing incident, he found out that Haru Makashima's game wasn't just an act. He hadn't seen her act like that himself since that time, but... Shikamochi might have. However, Yasunaga knew this, that this entity was someone to be revered and loved. Anyway, she was too poor to have a phone, so there's absolutely no way he could have called her. What a strange response. The explanation was a bit convoluted, but he understood it. Nanika 
さすが貴様は頭がおよろしいのあの町のお方のようじゃ惜しいことをしたかのえー、っととにかくじゃすぐに電話を切りなされえそれじゃあ話せなくなるでしょう全言撤回貴様はタコじゃん<笑>何ですかそれは本当に電話をしておるわけではないんじゃから切れても話せると申しておるいいから切らぬか死ぬぞ He understood that she was telling him he was in a bad situation and quickly hung up. Oh, she must. Yoki can. Do you mean on this? She knit it. More and she stay or she's all. Set me stay or she's this. Komuzuka she sets me one you got is a so called Nantoka. Kisama Saki Hodo Dokokani, then a Wokaketa Jaro. Susan Hodo Toy I think. かけました。そうだな。ここで電話しなくてもいいのかな。なるほど。じゃあ、ミサコも電話しなくていいのかな。たまたま時を同じくして呼び合った。坂巻きにねじり合う。三角の結界をなした。本来交わりがたき二つの世でも点が三つあれば結界をなすひどく無作法で不全なる回ですがのゆえにそれは読みの無事なを呼び込む God's words were too hard for even him to understand but he did remember that God had once been called Mujina a badger それはあなたとは違うんですね似て非なるもの。不浄なる役浄に降りて、人の闇から真の闇へ、生まれ落ちし者ども。それが結界の最も鋭き核から現れ、貴様を襲うやもしれなんだ。ようございましたな、我がおって。However, God's roundabout words were enough for him to learn a certain truth. A distant point and two points that were near. If standing on the triangle made by this, by this was dangerous. If standing on the triangle made by this was dangerous. Okay. It meant that Yasunaga was standing on it too. Were the two other points the phones Hisako had? Mamiya san wa ima, sonna toku ni irun desu ka? タコにもいな、いかにも。神様、山の神様でしょ。熱海のお刺身、いい意味じゃったの。食いしん坊を発揮してる場合じゃないだろ、はるちゃん。間宮さんはどこにいるんです物理法則が効かないくらい遠くって。じゃからその名で呼ぶな、気が散る。しかしまあ。よくよくお分かりじゃの神の奥ゆかしさも台無しじゃその女は煉獄におる That word wasn't in his vernacular He instantly turned around With an empty expression Yasunaga walked up to a PC in the library and awakened it from its sleep He turned on the browser, accessed the search site, and typed in Purgatory. Since the ruin excavation book he'd wanted to read was being lent to an American school, he'd spent his time reading a technical guide and using a PC. As a result, he'd come to understand computer interfaces, networks, the relevant base concepts, and how to use them. He looked at the search results and opened the Purgatory entry in the dictionary. He talked to, into the inactive phone again.
闇をそして夢を用いるそれはあまたの思い出のかけらが茅のごとく足のごとく茂るあれのそこを越えて人は神を望みまする間宮さんは死にかけてるっていうことですかそうとも違うとも言えましょうな事故とか皆女は生きながらにして煉獄に連れられたのであろうどうしてそんな神隠しなど昔は珍しいものをございましたぞふん<笑>今は昔じゃありません人を欺き門をかす神もおりますればそういった神ほど恐ろしく人の住む場所に紛れ狡猾に潜むもの特にそのお方様は誰が隠したか知っているんですねその女を救いたいと仰せか兄ちゃんはい一宿の恩がありますから我を称えるかお土産を山ほど持って帰りますよきかな機械を使うのでありましょうさらばこの国の道を行くことなかれ小姉を送ることもすべからず聞かれているからとか空恐ろしいお方じゃな貴様物分かりはいい方です You could always bring yourself ahead with the rest with his inhuman thought processes. This might have been due to the Higuchi blood in his veins. They were known to be good at government planning and tactics. Though he was not as extreme as Chikamochi, the three legged crow and servant of God, Yasunaga was no doubt a genius. So, yapari. Sayo, Kamina Kikuni o Keyushi, Kumi o Statame. Suddenly, the phone next to her ear rang, and Hisako, face wet with tears and snot, stared at the screen in shock. She could read the text. She looked around and found that the anomalies were nowhere in sight. Hisako wouldn't let that fool her, though. This place was definitely unnatural. Or perhaps she herself was going insane. It was impossible to assert that the paranormal was just a delusion. More importantly, the phone. It was an email. It was from an unregistered free mail address. Upon seeing the name before the At Mark, Yasunaga, she gasped loudly. With shaking fingers, she opened the email. I pray that you aren't filtering this domain. I assume you aren't, since the phone you gave me didn't have that setting. Due to certain circumstances, I found out you might be in danger, so I'm emailing you to confirm. You are in a place you shouldn't be. Everything you see is dangerous. Don't do much, and please send me more details. I will consider how to deal with it. Use the address given here. It should work. There was a copy paste of a very long URL there. She tried to open it, but couldn't access it because the phone wasn't in service range. As she thought about it, she got another one. I forgot to mention I am sending this mail from a foreign server. It seems that only networks in Japan are blocked. That's why you cannot access the local phone services and networks. The site I linked is foreign. Please open it using the internet. If you don't know how to do that, please wait while I give you instructions. Sokka was dumbfounded. Had he lied that he didn't know how to use a phone? He actually felt like he knew computers and networks even better than her. Anyway, she knew that Japanese phone networks were separate services provided by the carriers. So that was the reason why she couldn't access it. Sako chose the URL again and picked the option to open it in a browser. Success. It was a very crude but simple website. There were some Cyrillic letters on the top, probably an explanation, along with, text with a text form and a button, which was probably used to send the text. A web chat page. That meant she had to enter her nickname. She tried to input her own name and realized that she couldn't remember it. Yasunaga had already logged in as Yasu and repeatedly pressed the refresh button. Upon seeing a new person join, he raised his voice. But the person who logged in was called OKEQ? 
Was it a glitch? Did the phone display it wrong? But at that moment... Help. A short yet heavy message was displayed. What kind of place are you in? Kisaragi Station. I looked it up, but it doesn't seem to exist. It probably just looks like a station. Don't let it fool you. I know. I can feel that I'm in a weird place. I sometimes can't even tell what's real or not. It's bad. I can't even remember my name. Masina. He'd talked to God about this while preparing, and that got him a warning from the librarian. They would take the phone away again if he used it again. They would take the phone away if, they if he used it again. He had to be careful about using it, but he more or less already found out what he had to do. It was bad because of the warnings that God had given him. Don't drink or eat anything in the other world. Don't forget your own name. Don't turn around if chased. You're Hisakomamiya. Hisakomamiya. Say it and remember it. Hisakomamiya? Yeah, that's me. Thanks. Don't eat anything. I almost ate a weird fruit. What? Are you okay? I spat it out. Was that good enough? What if it just... A bit of a taste was fatal. But then again, she didn't actually accept it. Maybe it was just fine. It was probably a question of mentality. Tell me what Kisaragi Station is like. It took a while for her to respond. There's a single set of rails, no workers. It's all dark and cloudy. There's a vending machine. A train stop nearby. I got here by going to Tokyo. After I bought some water at the vending machine and almost drank it before spilling it, spitting it out, everything changed and became this warped, weird temple. Then I started feeling sick. It happened on the train, too. It became a mess, and I saw weird text. Apparently, these places change depending on the observer. It's, it's the concepts that matter. Why do you know so much about this? I'll tell you once you're back. We need to focus on the situation. You're in purgatory. All places where God exists can be escaped. Escaped. Huh? Where's Virgil? Where's Beatrice? And going to God means dying, doesn't it? He's talking about Dante. Yep. He didn't understand what she was talking about, so we looked it up. It was from a classical work called Divine Comedy. He was impressed by how knowledgeable she was. She is cultured, yes. I'll lead you through it. It's possible to save you if I can get there. Trust me. I don't really get it, but okay. You also might just be imagining that you don't feel so good. Try lighting a fire to feel better. I don't have a lighter, and I can handle this for now. Okay, now I had this idea. If purgatory is between heaven and hell, shouldn't they be the previous or latter stations? I see. Good idea, but I don't know where I got on this hev hell heaven tour. I don't know the details, but it seems like things would get worse if you kept writing. It did. It might have been a train to hell. Then maybe you should try heading back to the previous station. The train doesn't work, right? Right, but I don't want to ride it again anyway. Can you follow the rails on foot? Can I really trust you? I'm not 100% certain. Tell me if there's any new info. All right, I just saw the moon. Just so you know, it's six in the evening here. You're joking. Is the flow of time different there? That's not what I mean. This is bad. What is? Please respond. She really did see the moon. There was a space in the clouds covering the sky and a reddish moon peeked through it. It was in its first quarter, a half moon. Though it wasn't bright, it was it had a powerful presence and seemed to shine over all the platform. She just realized the strange unknown structure she couldn't see in the darkness had been right on top of the station. For a moment it seemed to be a light hanging strangely high, but that was no light source. It was a giant lens that gathered the moonlight. There were also metal mirrors all around and they occasionally released a light akin to the moon's. They were probably there to help the lens gather moonlight through focused reflection. It moved despite there being no wind. The more immediate problem was the fact that an unnatural device focused the moonlight into a ray of light that created a red dot on Hisako's chest. The redness filled her with fear, but then she jumped back, feeling that she had been targeted on purpose. It was like a moment from a movie where a vile sniper trained their laser sight on a protagonist. The light didn't follow Hisako. Instead, it went away from her and the platform to target the train. Suddenly, like a bit of ice melting under a laser, the train lost its false appearance. The new-looking train instantly became a crumbling, rusty wreck. And then it finally exposed its true form. 
She instinctively knew that the new appearance wasn't harmless to the sane world of men she knew. That moonlight was no light of judgment, and the moon was not the moon she knew. It was the evil moon of a different realm. Its power was to return things to their true forms. That was the light and the device. For a moment below, for a moment the below the pillar supporting the lens, she thought she saw a silhouette, which was either either a small human or a gigantic amphibian. She was no longer in a situation where her eyes could be trusted. The train had begun, had began, had begun to melt into a soft, transparent yet still metallic material. It had a chemifluorescence, the anomalous quality of the fruits. If Hisako had any knowledge in developmental biology, she would have compared it to the cellular change that happened during differentiation, which took place during the start of life or regeneration. Her impression of this event was more straightforward. It looked like a pupa going through metamorphosis. What was once a train was now standing. It was an extremely large beast. From head to toe, it had become a transparent body that could support its own immense flesh and bone. The white slimy skin had become a red-purple colored jelloid that spread throughout. Breaking through the bark-like mount material and spewing lots of mucus, the object grew branches, legs with multiple joints. They were small compared to its body, but they had the numbers. It grew more and more of these legs. And once it was done with that, the creature looked like a screw pine she'd seen in Okinawa. It felt like a malicious, heretical caricature of the strange tree that grew countless roots. That probably wasn't the best comparison. The thing was by no means a peaceful plant. This was a vile, gluttonous animal that lived only to eat and reproduce. Partially on reflex, she recorded a summary of her thoughts on her phone. Even though the extreme fear and shock had numbed her mind, she was well trained enough to pull that off. She looked down and saw the phone vibrate just before it stopped working. It had just run out of battery. Hisako could no longer get help. She had to handle this herself. Her goal was to return, for that she had to go to God, which required her to move and run away from the grayish pillar of flesh with comb-like teeth. It was even puking something. After looking at it, she realized something. With the train gone, she could see something that she lost sight of before. It was a station sign. It glowed white like a lamp, and she could see the hiragana for Kisaragi from there just fine. She jumped off the platform, landed with all her limbs, and began running, ignoring the pain of the impact. She could hear thuds behind her as something soft puked out from the floor, but she couldn't observe it. Following the rail running on the rocks, she hurried to the station sign. It looked like this. Kisaragi. Kataksu. Katasu. Darkness. Looking at how the train went, she'd come from Katasu and travel towards darkness. However, this left her confused. Katasu? Kesaragi? Darkness? What was that? Does Katasu refer to Nino Katasu... Nino Katasu Kuni? The world in Japanese myth had the heavens. Takamaga, Takamagahara. The netherworld, Yomi no Kuni. And this world, Ashihara... Nakatsu no Ashihara, Ashihara Nakatsukuni. Nino Katasukuni, also known as the Nino Kuni, had been the place where Izanagi and Suzano lived. Due to various circumstances, such as the root part of it, it ended up being considered the same place as Yomi no Kuni. The afterlife, basically. Hell. Was Katasu hell? But if that was the case, darkness would be heaven, but she barely knew any myths where darkness was good. <laughs> she began running and couldn't stop now. Where did she have to head? She was attacked by an unpleasant feeling again. Of course she would be. The sign had now displayed those disgusting hieroglyphs. She had no idea what it meant now, and behind her... Oh dear. The monster had begun to seem beautiful, beautiful and lovable to her. That was a mother. A mother beyond all bonds and blood, and an incarnation of motherhood that had manifested here in this world. And that, all that she birthed, would be consumed by her, then birthed again. It was an honor and a joy. The anomaly, still covered in transparent gelatin, had somehow retained human form. It was summoning Hisako, welcoming her. She'd embraced the child with those wet hands and 
summon her into reincarnation and the greatest pleasures. She almost felt like crying. She wanted to take off her clothing and be purified by the Great Mother, embraced by all. Even so, she could bear it. She successfully endured it. After all, she knew. Her discovery made her laugh in a strained, maddened manner. The puzzle she'd had in her head had finally been solved. Yes, Nagakun's hint was necessary, but its direction was off. Purgatory. Rengoku. Leng. She wasn't Dante, but Randolph Carter. Kisaragi meant moonlike. That meant it was a place to gather and use power from the distant moon of illusion. The moon's power had been prepared to open up a route into the great darkness. It was the pinnacle of the madness involved in connecting to a device from a universe that rejected the laws of physics. It looked like this simply because she was Japanese and a modern person. The place was basically a kind of hell wrapped in Isako's imagination. But, 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 if you recognize that, if you acknowledged the Necronomicon, Carter, Dreamland, Lang Plateau, Shub Nigaroth, Cthulhu, if you realize that the many mysterious stories left by H.P. Lovecraft could manifest as a real threat, then didn't that mean this world was on the verge of ending? As if that mattered to her. Hisako was an adult. She knew how to pick out things that were good for her and turn a blind eye to the contradictions and survive in a way that was no way fair. The Sako who knew the truth could ignore the fear it inspired to deal with the immediate threat. That basically made sense. But it made her pull herself together. She had no reason to hesitate any longer. Her destination wasn't Nino Katatsuni. Nino Katasukuni. It was something hidden in there. Katasu. Kadath. Station. <laughs> as far as she knew, this was a challenge. It was a place where few could find themselves. She didn't even know if normal people could live there. However, if the something that had led her here, she had a good guess about its identity, had made such a human-like trap, then getting there should be easy. After all, the rules had already been written. But that was when she was assaulted by the worst spell of dizziness and nausea yet. It nearly brought her to her knees. If she staggered around like this, everyone would catch her. She now understood why Yasunaga had suggested she light a fire, but she wasn't in a situation where she could do it. Would the other phone burn if she shorted its battery? What a pointless thought. The phone had a role to fill. In that case, she would use her minimal mythical knowledge to create a small fire. She opened up her notepad, clenched the ball, ball pen linked to it, and struck it against the granite floor at the edge of the stone with wriggling marks of evil all over it. The metallic ball instantly broke, but she didn't mind as long as it lasted long enough for her to finish. It would hold meaning even if it made this, like if it, even if made like this, surely. Line, corner, line, corner, line. Watching the transparent creature approaching her, she felt her intellect overwhelmed by fear and panic, but she still pressed on. This was how it was supposed to look like. A warped pentagram, or a tree-like symbol of divinity. In the middle of it, there was a figure akin to an eye or a flame. It wasn't a powerful weapon. If there was something better, this world would surely have been saved from the fear of Cthulhu by now. It would surely have hold, me hold no meaning against the Great Mother approaching her. But there were still its children the unnatural air here, and the entity controlling the moon lens. It could maybe work on them. She finished carving the Elder Sign. Next moment, the world screamed. It didn't actually deal much damage to the realm itself. However, even a simple needle could bring severe pain if used well. It was especially damaging to those who didn't expect such a retaliation. With a rending sound, things changed. First, it was the air. Perhaps not permanently, but it felt purified. Second, those chasing her writhed and faltered. The great mother behind them shook as if enraged and continued birthing more children. Now was the time. Now was the time to run. She sprinted. I'm going to Katasu Station. The second phone's about to run out of battery, too. I won't be able to contact you again. I trust you. Isako had logged in after OKEQ. Had logged out because of the first phone's battery had run out. 
After that message, no amount of refreshing the web page added anything new. A while later, Hisako logged out. No longer having any business in the empty chat page, Yasunaga closed the browser. After that, he placed the phone next to his ear. With just that, he closed the phone. As if to escape the librarian advancing in his direction and furrow with furrowed eyebrows, Yasunaga logged off the PC and left. There was nothing more he could do besides believe in them. Sako ran. She ran along the train tracks illuminated by a sinister moonlight. Her legs often got caught in the drain railroad, railroad ties, and she fell a lot. Her high heels were broken, but being barefooted would have made things harder. Her feet hurt so much she could barely feel her toes. She couldn't keep up with the tear she couldn't keep the tears from her eyes. Eventually all she could do was stagger forward, but even so she couldn't stop. She had an urge to look back. She actually thought she had to. For all she knew, she might have lost them completely. However, she knew better than the average person that turning around in such situations was a big mistake. Thus, she could just continued walking. She was to return to the boy who had worried sick about her. She would give him her thanks, as well as make him some eccentric yet delicious food. Which is that in mind, she continued walking. This might have continued on for an hour or two, maybe even longer. She continued walking, looking only at her legs. She walked. <laughs> If someone hadn't called out to her, she wouldn't even realize that she'd already reached her destination. She was now at a shabby dark station, much like the previous one. The sign there said Katasu. This place was... Called out once again, she looked to her left. There was a concrete platform within reach. And on it, there was a child. A silhouette of a child with a cheap-looking kimono and bobbed hair. The child's voice was androgynous and not very articulate. The moon was hidden now, and the only sources of light were the sky and the sign. Hisako couldn't see the child's face. The voice was innocent, but it was a bit strict and harsh, too. The child gave Hisako a hand. She, however, merely stared at it. It was so close, yet she couldn't see past the, the hand's shadow. A dark child. Could it be that? The sudden girlish voice made both Hisako and the child turn its turn to face its source. There was a strange looking figure near the ticket gate. She was clad in bandages and looked about sixteen or seventeen. With that, Hisako instantly knew who she had to trust. That was the song that Chami Serizawa had taught her back in Fujiyoshi. Ignoring the child, she ran to the platform, climbed up, and hid behind the girl. That was no longer a child's voice. It wasn't even human. The child had been replaced by a vortex of darkness that looked somewhat humanoid. However, that wasn't true darkness. It was a chaos that consumed all, even light. For a moment, Isako thought she'd seen three shining spots on its face, but she instantly looked away. If this thing wanted it, it could have prevented her from doing that. It could even crush her sanity completely. That was just how big of a deal this thing was. あなた様は手を出さぬ役場のはず。嘘だ。これからそうなる。そうやってこれから行く旅邪魔をするのか。もう次はせぬ。そうだね。お前はあの場所で我に囲まわれていた。弱々しき神のオオカミ
だからこっちにも戻ってこないで山の中でじっとしていてごしょうじゃふーんゆるそうありがたい橋本雄大を代わりにしようか Saka almost stopped breathing. Why would that name come up here? There was no reason to ask. She knew it all. Yamete, Kudasa. Jack, Teo. Waga Mama Dana. Inochi no Neda, Nanda to Motteru no. That was Hisako's line. However, she didn't have the guts to talk back against this dark, crawling chaos. Doste, Kono Nanoja. 夢の霧の中であまた苛なまれ切り刻まれし呪わしき魂闇の食事にふさわしいあのまま闇に届けるつもりがひさらぎで逃してしまった代わりにあやつを差し出そう The unnerving girl turned around to the ticket gates It was hard to see but there was a silhouette there He was a very old man. But why did it seem like there was a dagger in his throat? Tagui Marenaru, Yokoshima no Mitamaja. Anata. Ma ne. Shikash, Tsugiawan. Nani? Koshio. One chan. Yami ga ski nan de sho? これからたくさん見せてあげるよ約束が違う糧にならぬというならばせめて我が慰みとなるがよしおのが命運の細く短き様を嘆きつつそれを伸ばさんとして醜くあがき続けるがよし神は試練を与えるものそうだよねお姉ちゃんそれで身の程を知れ承知した行くぞ女 The girl dragged her past the old man who struggled for breath and out of the station into the dark road As Yasunaga, Yasunaga stood alone in the campus without purpose, the cell phone he'd borrowed rang. It made him jump. It was a call from a public phone. Could it be that. Moshimoshi! Atashi. Mamiya Hisako. Buzi de Staka. Ima doko desu? Buzi cha buzi kana. It's yo gotai manzoku da kedo. Sinu hodo tsukareta. Ima doko desu? Jitaku deska? Okutama. なんかすごい山の中に放り出されたあとは何とかしろってオリベ君とこの神様シビアすぎないままあでもいい神様ですよそうみたいねちょっと遭難しかけただけで人里を出られたしタクシー乗り継いで帰るタクシーですかとんでもない値段になるんじゃもう電車には当分乗りたくないのもっともですねとにかく迎えに行きます安全な場所で休んでいてくださいえっ3 hours later a taxi approached the Okutama bench his Hako Mamiya had been idling on <clears throat> the young man who got off instantly ran over to her. <clears throat> her whisper made her realize just how tired she was. However, there were no signs of the falling and vomiting she did in Kisaragi Station. Her high heels were okay, too, and the ballpoint pen wasn't broken. Her cell phones were still charged as well. Buzi de yokata des. Mmm. Jitsu no tokoro. Chotto ima demo shinjirare nai kedo ne. 
by this, she meant the experience itself. And the fact that she'd escaped from that being. She sighed, remembering that the boy was the definition of penniless. It was a valid problem to have, but it didn't make her feel good. She staggered a bit as she got up, but it was only due to her walk down the mountain and mental fatigue. Perhaps she'd even lost several of her sanity points. The thing had said that it would show her even more darkness. She wanted to brush it off as a joke. Like it only said that to menace and ridicule her. That was the kind of being it was. とりあえず帰ろっか。え、どうします? The words caught Isako off guard. それならいいかしら。マストの電車の方が楽だし。んどうしたんです？She was just having a moment of weakness. This boy was really dependable, but he really wasn't her type. Hell, he was even under age two and a lot younger than her. It'd be a crime. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad she brought it up. あ、そうだ。すみませんが、近いうちに休みずに来てもらえますか。どうして？なんかうちの神様が間宮さんを助けるためにいろいろあったらしくて、会わなきゃって言ってました。僕に渡したお守りだけじゃちょっと心もとない
We got in the taxi, and as Hisako listened to Yasunaga give directions to the driver, she finally relaxed. She was resolved to feed him her own food tomorrow. That sentiment was even stronger than it was the afternoon. That was because he'd saved her life, surely. They'd then go to Shikoku. It wouldn't just be just a drive, but a real trip. Then they'd visit his home. What a packed schedule. She was excited, tense, and strangely uneasy about it. She'd always yearned to experience something blatantly occult and paranormal. But now that now she knew it was something to enjoy from a distance. Hisako suddenly wanted to see that informant, Haruaki Fusaishi, again. That insolent man had gone through a mystery she hadn't, and she felt she could bond with him over their strange experiences. It was high time she made an appointment with him, so she resolved to make one at all costs. So, Mamiya-san. As the driver began taking them to the station, Yasunaga took something out and gave it to Hisako. What? A painting? Yes. Mamiya-san。これ、あなたの神様だったりしないわよね。ええ、これはもういない神様です。なら、まあ。She felt like she'd just seen a whole new face to the world. The beast mask with three red eyes carved on it made Hisako think of the darkness looming ahead of her, causing her to feel lethargic and look up at the taxi ceiling. The end. <sighs> that was a... Uh, that was a roller coaster. And my throat is now killing me. I think this is actually the longest video, this will end up being the longest video I've ever made on here. But I just felt like I had to keep going. So, there's going to be a lot to talk about next time, and I'm going to gather my thoughts, but the thing that's getting me most right now is the implication that Shinai-sama is still around. Somehow, some way, and is also involved with some Lovecraftian nonsense. Ugh, okay, let's leave it there for now. Hope you're all doing all right. I've been the warm. This has been Raging Loop Extra Stories. I'll see you for next time. <laughs>